alhamdulillah. So we have made it to the section, inshallah, where we're going to talk about what happens when somebody is in the barzakh and in the intermediary realm. So this is after somebody has now passed away and what is going to take place and then what happens between then and uh, the moment where we stand for judgment day, for Yom al uh, This, These are very, very, very important parts of our creed, parts of our aqidah, which we should know, which we should understand, and which we should experientially try to, uh, or which we should understand in a more experiential, spiritual way versus just a um, rational and logical way, because these types of things are going to be very significant. Allah wants us to reflect on these moments before we actually experience these moments. So what we had just finished off last time, we had spoken about what takes place in the grave and the human being will enter into the grave. We will have questions in the grave. We will experience a life, an entire life will play out, an entire lifetime. For some, it will be longer than others, um, depending on uh, how much duration takes place between the time we pass away and between Yom al Qiyama. For, people, for some people, they've had 10,000, 20,000 years in their grave, in their qabr, and others, it could be a lot less than that. So at some point, everybody will experience either a beautiful life in the grave, which is a sign, inshallah, of jannah to come, of heaven to come, or a very, very, very difficult life in the grave, which is a sign of the fire, and we ask Allah for uh uh, for safety and refuge um, and, and for protection from that. And then at some point what happens is Allah commands one of the archangels to blow the trumpet. And this is mentioned in the Quran, the first blast which takes place. As Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran, that the horn is blown and all those who are in the heavens and the earth will fall down in a swoon. So everyone will essentially pass away at this point or become unconscious, save him who Allah wills. Um, so this is the first blast which takes place. And uh, every human being will at this point pass. Every human being. So if, if somebody is not already in the grave, there will be a small percentage of people, of course, who will still be on the earth at this point. And the blast will take place and then everybody will essentially um, uh, transition into this realm. And this is the first phase now. At this point, we are about to enter into the life of Yom al Qiyamah. We have another period now where another blast will take place, as Allah says in the Quran. Then it is blown in, this, in the next, uh, right there in, in the same ayah. Then it is blown another time, and there they stand awaiting. And according to Imam al-Haddad, between the two blasts are 40 years. So human human beings will be, everybody will pass away and enter into this intermediary realm until the second blast takes place. And now everybody is actually resurrected. This is the trumpet where everybody is resurrected. Um, so the first thing for us to reflect on here is that these are very, very, very serious, momentous um, uh, uh, events that are going to take place. It's not a light, um, you know, alarm or something that's going to go off. They mention in some, I believe Mama Ghazali mentions this, that the distance between the, the two um, lips of the archangel who's going to blow the trumpet and the trumpet itself is vaster than, than the earth itself, vaster than the heavens and the earth. So we're talking about something very, very, very significant in terms of its size, in terms of its magnitude, in terms of all of Allah's creation being affected and jolted and in such a scared state when this takes place that everybody is going to pass. And then everybody is going to be awakened again. And this is where people are either awakened in a state of goodness or in a state of anxiety and worry. And now begins the day of judgment. Now begins the hour, the, the, the day of judgment. Uh, or or the, the Yom al Qiyamah. So then what he mentions is he mentions what will take place in the moments before the actual first trumpet is blown. So we have different phases of end of times that are important for the Muslim, for, for us as Muslims to know. You have the signs of the general end of times. The first sign of the end of times is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He is the final messenger. And he said between me and the, the, the I believe between me and the hour is the hadith is like this. So already the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is indicating to us that it's very, very, very close. 
between then many, 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 many signs have been listed out. Dozens of signs have been listed out of what is going to take place in the latter days. So those are signs which are important. He doesn't get into all of them here because that's not really what his focus is. Then there's the signs of what happens before the hour. The hour is the end, the actual end of time when this trumpet blast is blown. At this point, time as we know it collapses. This concept of time, space, everything goes. It's now just Allah and whoever the select that Allah has left out with his archangels or whoever is referring to in this ayah where Allah says, save him who Allah wills is, is protected from this blast. Everybody else is, is impacted. So that moment, um, it's important for us to know, okay, what are the signs of the general end of times? And then what are the specific signs which lead to the hour, which lead to the hour? So you have a phase of time where we know that as you get closer to the end, immorality will spread, corruption will spread. We'll have very, very corrupt rulers and leaders. There will be a lot of fahsha, of, 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 of lewdness. Um, we know that the economic system will become uh, problematic as well. These are many signs that are listed out. Then we know that at some point the Mahdi alayhi salam emerges. And then we know that, that the, 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 the Jal comes. It's at this point now that the main events really start to take place, which will signal the coming of the hour of Yawm al-Qiyamah. Isa alayhi salam eventually emerges. And it's important for the believers to understand this, to know this. Um, and then we have now a, a various hadith which indicate what happens after this. So he says that um, uh, after the emergence of Isa alayhi salam, you will then have the emergence of uh, who will kill the Dajjal. And then he says there will be a period of years people will live during which there will be no enmity between people. And then there will be a wind that Allah sends from the direction of Syria. And anyone who has any faith or goodness in them will die. And then the people who will remain. So now we're getting into the last phase of humanity. The people who will remain at the end end will be the worst of people moving like as, delicate, uh, as delicately as birds wearing the skins of beasts, recognizing no good, disapproving of no evil. And shaitan will, will basically command them to obey his call, command them to worship idols and, um, and, and, and commit uh, fahsha and lewdness. And it will be on these people that the horn that the horn will be blown. So at the ultimate end, you have a period of difficulty, of general immorality in society. And then you actually have a period of righteousness again. The Mahdi coming and Isa alayhi salam coming are going to be period where they're righteous rulers, ruling the earth according to um, the law of Islam and according to a very, very, in a very just way. And then after this whole phase is when there's going to be immense, immense, immense immorality. And one hadith, um, it, the Prophet ﷺ mentions, uh, Muhammad, that the hour will not come as long as anyone still says Allah. As long as someone still says Allah, the hour will not come. So you're talking the hour, the final blast comes at the moment again when there's no iman, no faith, or people to say Allah or la ilaha illallah. And then he said evil people were, will remain living like donkeys in chaotic depravity. And it is upon them that the hour shall come. So comparing people to donkeys is a very serious thing, especially in the, uh, with the Arabs, because they were an agrarian society. Um, and so they were very, very, the animals were very present in front of them. And it was very, uh, the donkey is not um, uh, seen as an animal. That's, that's, that's a very uh, highly ranked animal. It's, it's a diss, really, to compare someone to. So these are the type of people that they are. They're just animalistic, carnal desires. And then in the Hadith Qudsi, meaning it's a narration from Allah, Allah will grasp, or, or, or this narration from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Allah will grasp the earth and fold up the heavens and then on, in, in his right hand, figuratively speaking, and say, I am the king. Where are the kings of the earth? Where are the tyrants? Where are the arrogant? So you will now have a very intense, jalali, majestic, these, these moments will be very difficult. The last juz of the Quran and surah, uh, uh, the 29th juz and the 30th juz, they, a lot of those surahs talk about what's going to take place on the Day of Judgment. So it's very important for believers to have a connection to those surahs, to reflect on the meaning of those surahs, and, and to try to understand the intensity. There's surahs that mention the sky splitting asunder, like literally the entire sky will crack in half 
and the heavens will start to split and all the whole firmament, everything Allah has created will start to, it's not, it's not, we see it as though it's in place in perfect order. But as soon as the command comes from Allah, everything will go into chaos. Everything will go into chaos. And it is upon this. So this is the type of moment that we are, we are entering when the day of judgment comes. What keeps us firm on the day of judgment and preventing ourselves from being in internal disarray is our faith and is the way we lived our life. That's what keeps us firm. There's no outward preparation one can do. There's no money. There's no bank accounts. There's no politics. There's no rulers. There's nothing. There's no organization, nothing that's going to help anybody. But if they were people of virtue and people of righteousness and people of goodness and people of nur, the day of judgment will be facilitated, inshallah, for the believers. Even we met, it's, it's, I don't know if we mentioned it here or, or, or if um, it was just mentioned when we were reading this, but uh, the believers will have a light on their faces and the day of judgment will be dark and they will be guiding people. They could be guiding people. People will ask them to guide them but the believers will have a light on their face from their wudu. Um, actually, I believe narration is people will ask them for their light and they won't share the light because these will be the hypocrites and the disbelievers that, were at, that are asking. So everything we do in this life, it starts playing out at the time of death. It has an impact. Like the way we live this life does have an impact on this life. But for a lot of people, they won't see the impact in this life. This is why the rulers, the, the corrupt, they get away with so much. They have no idea what's in store for them no clue what's in store for them for all the corruption and the killing and the violence and the injustice that they that they reign on, on on earth because allah says now he will see and allah will be angry on this day where are the rulers where are the kings where are the tyrants because allah is the true king and allah does not let people outwardly always understand his kingship if they're not trying to understand his king but on the day of judgment his lordship and his rule will become very, very, very clear. So it's a day we're supposed to fear that day. It's not supposed to be a, uh, you know, it's, it's one of the things where even the prophets, they fear this day. It's a very, 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 very serious day um, and, and, and face. So it's good to know the signs that come and leading up to it. So he mentions, you will not see the hour. This is, again, the blowing of the trumpet until the following things happen. The sun rising from the west. There's going to be a big smoke at some point on the earth the Dajjal, there's going to be a beast that emerges from the earth. There's going to be three sinkings into the ground. I don't know if this means earthquakes or I think the earth will split open and these sinkings will happen in the east, in the west, and in the Arabian Peninsula. And the appearance of Isa alayhi salam and Yajuj and Majuj and the last of them will be a fire coming out of the Yemen. And so these are big signs that happen right before again the trumpet is blown. The trumpet is blown. But only Allah knows when the hour is going to happen. So we know as believers through the Prophet ﷺ and through what's been passed, the signs of the hour. But when the Prophet ﷺ was asked by Jibreel ﷺ, when is, Yom, when is the hour? He said, the one asking knows no more than the one being asked. The closest of Allah's associates, uh, as, 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 like angels, I mean, um, they're, even they don't know. The messengers, Allah's Habib Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam doesn't know when the exact moment of the Day of Judgment is going to be. Only Allah knows, as he says in the Quran, knowledge of it is with my Lord. He alone will manifest it in its time. And indeed with him is the knowledge of the hour in a different ayah. But we have to know the signs and, and what's going to happen. So phases, it's a phase of general moral depravity, general corruption on the earth. That's the phase we're in right now. Um, immense immorality. Immense, um, it's mentioned in other hadith, the amount of promiscuity that will take place. All of these types of things are showing that we are headed towards the end, towards the, we are in the latter days. And then there's signs that have already started to appear. Example in the hadith, which, which he doesn't mention here, but um, <clears throat> where the Bedouin will compete in building tall buildings that will literally touch the sky, right? These skyscrapers in Dubai, in Saudi Arabia, and other places, all people were Bedouin, and now they, they got you know, they stumbled upon oil and now they're competing to build these huge tall buildings. And when one country builds one that's taller, the next one starts its next one so they can be taller and it can just be, it's, so these are signs that will happen. But those aren't the major signs. The major signs are the ones that are listed out. And and so after the coming of Isa alayhi salam and, and the killing of the Dajjal and the coming of Yajuj and Majuj, then there's this final period of immense immorality and no faith left. Meaning nobody at that point, they say in one narration here, that 
Islam will wear out, this is according to the Prophet ﷺ, in a way that a garment becomes worn out until no one will know what fasting, prayer, pilgrimage, or charity might be. The book of God will one night be taken up, subhanAllah, so that not one verse of the Quran will remain on earth. Some group of people will remain in which old men and women will say, we remember that our parents used to say, la ilaha illallah, so we say it too. So again, one of the key components of holding down Iman on this earth is what is knowledge. The knowledge of these things, once it goes, it's a big problem. It's one of the main things that we can do as believers is spend our time learning and implementing. And it's already happened as an ummah. We've lost knowledge. We've kind of just not given importance to it anymore. But we're just talking about the sacred knowledge, knowledge of Islam, um, really prioritizing it. So these are, these are things that are important for us to do to prevent the impact of the end of times hitting us or our family. Inshallah. So then... Now he gets into the next se section, which is actual judgment day, which is actually the, the day. So at this point, everybody is resurrected. So he says the fourth life, this is the fourth life. So we finished the third life, which is the barza and the, the <clears throat> first trumpet blast. He says the fourth life now extends from the time when a person leaves their grave for the resurrection <clears throat> until, a mo until the moment when mankind enters either the garden or the fire. So this is the first the fourth life for the human being. Um, oftentimes we think about Yom al Qiyamah as a day. It's not a day, it's a whole life in and of itself. As Allah says in the Quran, 50,000 years, it can be up to 50,000 years in length. For others, it will be a lot shorter. And for some, it could be as short as two rakahs, but it is an entire life, it's an entire phase. One is resurrected and one is rebuilt, re originated again. So one will die and they will be in their grave entirely. And they will be the, the, we will decompose, our bodies decompose. But just like Allah originated the creation the first time, kun fayakun, he will, we will all come back to life again. We will all be re-originated again. This is for the people of the, of, at, the at the time um, when this was being revealed, it was a little bit harder for them to understand. For us now, you know, with stem cells and these types of things, it's very uh, easy to see how you can like recreate as long as you have the origin, right? For Allah, he doesn't even need the origin. He is the originator. He's al-fatir. Um, but this is how it's going to take place. So then there's a various ayahs that he mentions here. Um, what Allah will command the archangel Israfil. This is the one. So there's various archangels. Jibreel alayhi salam is one of them. Israfil alayhi salam is one of them. Mikael alayhi salam is one of them. Um, and so you have different archangels that have these big assignments that Allah has given them major assignments, and this is his assignment. He's waiting for this moment to blow the trumpet. And he says, and the horn is blown, and lo, from their graves they will hasten to their Lord. Then it is blown another time, and there they stand awaiting. So this is the moment where all of us, we will wake up from the grave, and then this is when everybody who didn't think that life was, life was done, they thought life is done after they died. Or maybe just life in the grave is it. This is where the anxiety really starts to kick in. Those who disbelieve, they claim that they will not be raised again, Allah says. Say, no, by my Lord, you will be raised again and you will be informed of what you did, everything that you did. <clears throat> so it's, it's, it's going to be a, a day where somebody realizes this and it's very difficult for them to, to, to think, I'm about to be held to account. Because in the grave, that counting is not the type of accounting that's about to take place now. This is the day of accounting. One of the names of it is the day where debts fall due. Yom ad-Din. Maliki Yom ad-Din, as we read in the Fatiha. The day where the debts fall due. Everything, not a single iota is left out if Allah keeps it on the record. And if Allah chooses to erase and to pardon, then it's pardoned. But everybody has their chance on this day to get what it is that they deserve in form of justice or hopefully for the believers and for the, this ummah then in the form of Allah's mercy. So he gets into various ayahs of, um, for those who question the resurrection says, have they not seen how Allah originates creation and then reproduces it for God that is easy and say to them, walk the land and see how he originated creation. Then how God brings forth the later growth, meaning you think about this in terms of plants and vegetation, there's these cycles, right? It, like it, it dries out and then it comes back and then it, and the human being very similar, right? It's not hard for just like Allah can do that with, with plants and with fruits and so on and so forth. It's very easy, very easy for him to do that um, with, with us. 
Uh, indeed, Allah is able to do all things. And then, and then he mentions, um, again, there's various ayahs, we're just picking out a few of them. Um, that Allah gave, gives us an example, right? And he says, who will revive bones which have rotted away? Say he will revive them who first originated them and he has knowledge of every creation. So just like the one who first created us, he's going to be the one who revives us. So in this day, it's a literal physical, we believe in a physical resurrection, not in a figurative spiritual resurrection, incarnation, any of that. No, no, no. It's a real physical experience that happens. Physical experience that happens. Um, so now this is where things become, again, focused on one's faith and their yaqeen. According to one's strength and their ma'rifah of their Lord, their knowledge of their Lord, and their yaqeen of their Lord, um, and their acts in this life and their relationship with Allah, that will determine how things go for them on this day. That will determine, or on this phase of life, this whole life. We should not just say this day, really this, this um, phase of life. So this is a long narration, but it's important to cover. So the Prophet wasallam said that Allah will level the earth. Okay. So the narration says in the Quran, the verse says, on the day when the earth shall be changed to other than the earth and the heavens, they will come forth from before God, the one, the invincible. He will level it and spread it just as a leather rug is spread. So you will see neither crookedness nor curvature. He will then drive the people to one in one cry and they will be in the changed earth, in this new understanding of earth, whatever the create, the, this is, in the same state that they had been in, in the way before, those who were inside it will be inside of it. And those who are on its surface will be on its surface. Then God will send up, down upon you from beneath the throne, water called, Al Hayawan, the life, and it shall rain for 40 days. And then the narration continues. Okay, so this is him getting it. And then he will give command to the bodies, which will grow just as plants and vegetables grow until your bodies are as fully formed as they've been. So now this narration is getting into more details on how exactly the, the, the resurrection will take place, meaning it not necessarily sudden, but it takes a um, uh, uh, a, 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 a phase of time. And then Allah goes command by command. Let the bearers of the throne return to life. And this will happen, meaning the, the angels who carry the throne. Let Jibreel, Mikael, Israfil come back to life. They come back to life. And then Israfil, uh, the archangel, alayhi salam, he is the one who then blows this, this, this horn, this trumpet. After which Allah will call the spirits which will be brought to him and the Muslims will be glowing with light, the others dark. The others dark. And then Israfil blows the horn and the spirits fly out like bees, filling the space between the heavens and the earth, in which Allah then says, let each spirit return to its body. By my might and majesty, let each spirit return to its body. So the believers, the spirits, are not in the same place as the body necessarily, right? So now the spirits are returning into the bodies. Then he gets into a lot of detail. The spirits will repair to their bodies, enter through the nostrils, and will spread inside of the body again, just as venom spread inside spreads inside someone who is bitten. Then the earth shall split, split apart from around you, and I shall be the first for whom it will do so. Meaning the Prophet and he says, "You will emerge as young people of 33." So this is the the the, the age at which one is uh, is at. Right, 33 is this this prime age as mentioned in various narrations. Um, this one mentions the language on that day will be Syriac, uh, and then he talks about them hurrying to their Lord. So not every single detail is something that we'll um, get into in this hadith. It's an excellent, comprehensive, and religious, like all hadith are, uh, but very, very good for us to just understand these, these specific details. So I don't think it's, usually, it's that difficult, like we're mentioning, to believe the concept of resurrection and the concept of coming back even though we rotted away. For the people of the past, it was a very difficult concept to understand. So there was a lot of time in metaphors and in um, analogies and in detailed explanations of what takes place and how that's going to happen. For the believers, the key thing to spend time on is to understand how intense and mighty uh, this day will actually be. So 
We won't go into everything, but for those who have the book, the text, and for those online, we're reading the text of The Lives of Man by Imam al-Haddad. I would highly recommend reading this section in detail. For the sake of time, we can't go line by line. Um, but Allah mentions this in the, uh, in, in the uh, mostly in the 30th juz, but in various parts of the Quran, where he talks about the uh, intense events that are going to take place, that are going to take place. So he says, subhanahu wa ta'ala, on the day when we will cause the mountains to move, you shall see the earth emerging and we assemble them and leave not one of them until they are before their Lord in ranks, in rows. You have come to us just as we created you at first, but you thought that we would set no time, no appointment for you. So the many, 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 many human beings do not believe that anything's going to happen to them after they die. And so Allah is now going to challenge them on that day. You thought nothing was going to happen. You thought you could just get away with it. You didn't get away with any of it. Now the appointment starts. Now the key spiritual thing to reflect on here, the feeling we need to reflect on is how on earth are we going to be able to stand before God Almighty, the creator of the heavens and the earth and all seven heavens, who's vast and and, and who's, who, who will be upset on that day when we, are, when we sin so much. Because every sin we are, commit will be expo exposed on that day and we will be questioned about everything. Allah will ask, you were there at this place when you were 23 years old at 5.17 p.m. Why did you do that? You were there at this place. It was 6 a.m. It was Fajr time. Why did you miss the prayer? You were there at this place prioritizing this thing, this money over this. You took out this financial instrument, which was haram, when you didn't need to do so. Why did you do that? Did you not trust that I would provide for you? I gave you this much time and this many, um, uh, uh, this much life. Why did you spend your life the way that you did? I gave you the blessing of wealth and I gave you the blessing of security, the, two, the, the blessing of food and security, the two essential blessings. Allah says in the Quran, worship uh, 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 that Allah says, worship the Lord of this house in Surah Quraysh, who, 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 who satiated you from your hunger and gave you the blessing of protection and security. So he's going to ask us, I did all of this, and yet you still didn't, didn't listen and you still didn't worship. And so these are going to be the, the questions that are asked on Yom Al-Qiyamah. These are going to be various, various, various types of questions. Some narrations mention the beginning. These are the, we're just giving examples here. Um, they mention the types of, uh, of questions that are going to be asked, the types of questions that are going to be asked. Um, so the, on Wednesdays, we're praying at eight. So if you guys want to do a Jamaat right now, you Bismillah, go ahead. So we'll, we'll pray around eight. Um, and then the every human being will be questioned according to how much we repented or didn't repent. What do we mean by that? Meaning, there will be parts of our life where we're not questioned about, but we did do something wrong. And we're, and, and we're going to wonder, hold on a second. I, I thought I did something wrong on that day. You didn't bring it up. Allah says, no, you repented for that. So repentance in this life functions as the eraser. It erases all the things. It's like taking the, Allah will show us a, whole movie of our life and it's like the director's cut where you cut certain things out of the clip and you edit it and that's it that's what repentance does it cuts out the sins and the bad uh, and of course for those who did certain things before they became muslim all of that inshallah is wiped away um, and, and so we are now entering upon we're in the month of shaban we have about a month left before the month of ramadan ramadan is this month of purification and of repentance and these are the types of things that should drive us anytime we're feeling lazy, anytime we're feeling like we don't want to do the things we're supposed to do, really focus on, on worshiping our Lord. Um, in one narration, a man dies or a person dies in accordance with the way that they had lived and is resurrected in accordance with what they had, with, with, with what he had died on, what they had died in. So some people will be resurrected in the way that they died. We, so imagine a very, very, if, uh, ig uh, not a noble death, an ignoble death. Imagine that, right? If someone, um, we don't want to be in that state right now. These days, there's people, like a year or two ago, there was this um, concert that took place. I forgot where. This happens all the time in concerts, but 
literally all these people died in a mosh pit at a concert. I mean, and while listening to like immensely haram music and participating in a lot of haram type of activities around them. That's no way that that's not a dignified way to die. We ask Allah for protection. We don't want to be doing things. We never want to enter into a state that we die in an ignoble, in, a, in an unnoble way, right? That should be one way thing to protect us. If the fear of God is not going to protect us from the sin, we don't want to die in a way that, that um, uh, the fear of death rather than the fear of the resurrection should protect us. We always should ask Allah for husn al-Khatima. Often people die on college campuses. Um, uh, uh, I know I know people who passed away. Literally, they 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 were found intoxicated and pa uh, passed away through alcohol poisoning, just on a, on the floor of a of a fraternity house, just after a long long night of partying. That's no way to die. That's not a noble. But if we don't live in a noble way, it's if we're exposing ourselves to those types of things, right? Uh, or 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 we let ourselves go into so slip ups. If we live through the slip up, we can repent. But what if we don't live through the slip up? That's the key. A lot of people, when we're young, especially, and you talk about this when you're young, controlling your passions are very hard when we're young. But there's no guarantee that somebody is going to live righteously after because they might not even have life afterwards. And so we want to make sure again that we live in an upright way so that we can pass in an upright way. Another narration, he mentions, mankind shall be resurrected barefoot naked and uncircumcised, everybody on one plane. And Aisha says, uh, radiallahu anha, Ya Rasulullah, oh shame, Ya Rasulullah. Everyone looking at each other, because that's the natural thing that comes to their mind, men and women all in one place in this, in this situation. He says the situation will be way too desperate for them to be worried about that. Like, that's not even going to cross anyone's mind. None of those types of things are going to cross anyone's mind because of how desperate human beings are going to be on Yom al -Qiyamah. These are the types of things, again, we need to reflect on. It's not just like something we should think about rationally. We really sit with and how am I going to be able to do it? And then there will be people with sweat at various levels of sweat, how much they're sweating. Some people to their ankles, to their knees, to their navel, to their neck and others that are drowning in their own sweat because of how scared they are of what's about to take place and also because the sun is very 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 close on the day of judgment which is why we want to be under allah's the shade of allah's throne on this day inshallah then he says people shall be gathered more hungry than they've ever been more thirsty than they've ever been uh unclothed and more naked than they've ever been and more exhausted than they've ever been but those who had given food for the sake of Allah will be fed by Allah. Those who had given drink, water for the sake of Allah, this says drink, but assuming water for the sake of Allah, will be given to drink by Allah. Those who had given clothes for the sake of Allah will be clothed by Allah. And those who had acted for Allah's sake will be protected by him. Emphasizing the Prophet وسلم, gave, uh, gives us various narrations, <coughs> reasons why we should take care of the poor, why we should take care of, of, of those who are... Uh, living in destitute conditions, of those who are unclothed, of those who are hungry. It's among one of the most virtuous types of good deeds. But it will all come back. All of it's going to be paid back in various ways. And Allah is too generous for you and me to do something that's good, one good, and for him to just give us one good in return. That's just not how it works. What is the reward for excellence except excellence? His excellence in response to our attempt at excellence is not even close. So his, what, what the good that Allah gives is very, very, very different. So we want to uh, take a portion of each of these things and put them into practice. Okay, if we don't feed people often, there's a lot of hungry people around here. We don't have to even, we don't have to go as far out as like the Muslim world or donating online. That's very critical to do as well. But we just go make it a habit. Once a month, I'm going to buy a bunch of pizzas and go and feed the homeless, right? Um, and and we should do so in groups and be careful, um, sisters. I would not advise in Oakland area necessarily if you're not uh, to do that as much. And, and brothers, I would be careful because it's not as safe here as, it, as as because of drug use and so on and so forth. But if we can find an area like a shel homeless shelter or like a, a soup kitchen or something, these are very good things to do. This is believers used to live their life. Like if people were hungry, they would have a hard time going to sleep. It was like, that's how serious we, people used to take this. And then we should give a lot of money in, in uh, overseas or wherever we can to 
uh, help people who are hungry. The, the, the current, the dollar goes very far overseas. Like you could feed with like $2, you could feed somebody a whole meal, two meals sometimes. So, you know, a hundred bucks, that's 50 meals to somebody, right? Um, and so we really, really, uh, these, are, these are ways to build our spiritual bank account. Um, and anytime we spend on ourselves and we buy an expensive meal, you know, sometimes um, we might spend a lot on food. We should make sure that 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 in that same phase of time we go and we spend on people um, less, even if it's a lot less money, but just go and spend and feed people, right? Because it's hard to be spending fifty, hundred dollars on on food for like two, three people, and I'll, so many people are hungry. Right? And so these are ways to protect ourselves, not just in this life from tribulation, but also in the next life. He then says that there's there's other things that I mentioned here, but we're gonna we're gonna um, just kind of shorten it. He says people will see their deeds appearing before them. Good deeds will comfort them and accompany them. Wicked ones will reproach them and make them feel desolate. And they will may even climb on their backs and force them to carry the deeds, as Allah Taala says in the Quran. They bear their burdens upon their backs. Evil is that which they bear. And in another ayah, they will surely bear their own loads and other loads besides their own. And they will be questioned on Yom al Qiyamah concerning that which they have invented. So everybody has recording angels. Everybody. These angels are recording everything we do. Allah doesn't need any angel to record what we do, but this Allah's intizam on this planet, on this earth, and this life is to do things through means, not. And that's usually how things are done. So the, the angels are the means. The angels are um, writing down every good and every bad. All of those now are going to be shown to the human beings on the day of judgment. So he says, evil deeds committed in this world for people who will die, who died unrepentant will become manifest upon them. So usurers, those who took interest or who charged interest, for instance, will see their stomachs grow so large that as they walk, they're constantly overbalanced by their weight and they stumble over. This is on the Yom al -Qiyamah. We're not talking yet about the, the, what, what happens in, in, in the next life. Adulterers, those who committed adultery, will see their privates swell so large that they will have to drag them along on the ground. Alcohol drinkers will come to the gathering with their cups, their, their cups in their hands, their drinks in their hands. Liars, backbiters, slanderers will see their tongues lengthen until they reach their tests and their chests. Those who withheld their zakat will have their money made manifest in the shape of large snakes coiled around them. The arrogant will be brought forth in the form of small ants. The arrogant people, the tyrants, they'll just be like little ants on the day of judgment. And they will be walked on um, by, by, by people. And so it shall continue. Allah says in the Quran, the guilty will be known by their marks and it will be, they will be seized by the forelocks and their feet. So there's a lot of things that take place um, on, and, on Yom al Qiyama. We will try to get through a bit more of it, but this, this section is just starting to give a glimpse of what happens to somebody with the sins that we do. Every sin in the spiritual realm has a magnified opposite reaction, right? We say like every action has an equal and opposite reaction according to um, uh, the, the laws of, of, I think that's Newtonian physics, right? According to laws of physics. In, in, in the spiritual realm, every action we do here has a much more amplified reaction in the next life, especially when it comes and to the good will have prominence, right? All the, for example, doing some, doing wudu consistently brings about an immense nur, but doing and praying and so on has a lot of good. But, but for example, missing zakat, Right? Having their money made manifest in the shape of large snakes that are coiled around them, right? assuming they're constricting them. These are the types of things that take place on Yom al Qiyamah. And this is before the resurrect, the, the Hisab hasn't even started yet. We haven't even started questioning, ask, being asked questions by God. This is just from the time we get resurrected, if we were in this state and we were doing these types of things, this is what's going to happen. So, What's interesting here is so many of these sins are also are sins of character as well. They're not only sins of actions. They're sins of actions and they're sins of character. So drinking um, and, the, and adultery and these types of things, taking usury, taking interest. Um, off this, our time and our, the time we live in, this is, stuff is spread out everywhere. 
we have to guard ourselves against believers and guard our families and our children from this. But also their sins of character, right? Arrogant doesn't only mean tyrants. It doesn't only mean the Bidens and the Netanyahu's and all these evil people in the world. No, it also means the person who's arrogant with their own family, who's arrogant with their with their spouse, who's arrogant with their friends. And these the arrogant can mean anything really. Um, so akhlaq and character who's arrogant towards other Muslims, right? Akhlaq and character are really, really, really important ways because the light of good character very quickly uh, reduces and mitigates the darkness of the bad that um, one might have done. So then the narrations uh, continue. So Mu'ad ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu asks the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He says, Ya Rasulullah, what of the saying on the day when the horn is to be blown and you shall come in hosts, in, assuming like groups? And the Prophet sallallahu said, oh Mu'ad, you have asked about a formidable thing. And then he sallallahu alayhi wasallam wept abundantly. And then he said, 10 different kinds of people of my nation will be gathered in groups distinct from the groupings of the Muslims. Their forms will have been changed. Some of them will have the forms of monkeys, others the form of pigs, others will be upside down, their legs upwards being dragged on their faces. Some will be blind, hesitant. Others will be deaf and dumb with lacking in reason. Others will be chewing their tongues, which will hang on their tests, and their saliva will be pus so that they disgust the other people in the gathering. Some will have their hands and feet cut off. Some will be crucified on tree trunks of fire. Some will be fouler than putrid cadavers, the smell, the stench. Some will wear robes flowing of tar. As for those who resemble monkeys, they are the slanderers. The slander, we talked about slander last time, is one of the main reasons of punishment in the grave. Talking bad about people and spreading lies about people. Slander specifically is when you not just say something bad, but you say something bad that's not even true. And then backbiting is when it's, when it's true, which is essentially just as bad. Those who will have the forms of pigs are the people of ill-gotten, illicit, unlawfully taxed, or you could say stolen type of money, illicit wealth, haram money. Those whose heads and faces are beneath them, their heads and their faces are beneath them, are those who consume usury. Usury is mentioned a lot in the narrations about the Day of Judgment and about um, Yom al qiyamah and also in the Quran. It's probably, I would argue, the most, the biggest sin, major sin, that's the most ignored in the time that we live in. And the one that we have to be very seriously on watch, usury is interest. It's the small interest and it's the big interest. We have to be on guard against it. And we mention this frequently because it's very, very, very critical. Every type of interest bearing loan, car loans, it, it, it's not far to drive a nice car. We don't need a loan to take out. We can do it other ways. Student loans, it's not far. This is so critical. People think it's far to go to university. There's not a single pillar of Islam which says it's far to go to university and take out a loan in order to do so, right? The vast majority of the world right now Billions of people are living, going, having gone to university without ever taking out any interest or any loan. Because in many other countries, it, you don't need that. But we're choosing to live in this country. And then we're choosing to do something haram. We could, Allah says, to travel the earth and do whatever is, we need to do to, to worship him. Right? So it's, these are not excuses that we're allowed. And if we've done it, we have to make repentance. Same thing with um, personal loans, with business loans, with credit card loans with high APR on our credit cards and that we don't pay off. All these things that the consumeristic lifestyle that the America, the, the capitalistic country has built itself on, we have to take it ourselves into account because there's serious repercussions that haven't even talked about what's going to happen in, 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 uh, uh, in the final afterlife. He said the blind then are those who rule uh, with tyranny. The deaf and dumb are those who are proud of their actions. Proud of their, we're assuming here this means religious actions, but it could mean other things as well. Those who chew their tongues are the ulama and the judges whose conduct differed from their words. The people, these, so these are Muslims. He's talking here about, he said, O Mu'ad, these are just gathered in groups. 
distinct from the groupings of the Muslims. So either they're, they're not necessarily Muslims, they could be um, uh, anyone who could be in this category according to this wording. The, uh, but in this group, obviously the ulama and the judges, right? He said, those whose hands and feet are cut off are those who injured their neighbors, hurt their neighbors. Those whose cru who were crucified on trunks of fire are those who frequently denounced people to the authorities. Don't know exactly what that one means. Um, those who are fouler than putrid cadavers are those who enjoyed passions and pleasures, but withheld Allah's due in their wealth. So what was we were supposed to pay in our zakat and our charity, didn't people, we didn't do it, but we enjoyed the money that we had. Right? Zakat and dodging the zakat is serious. It's not a joke. 2.5% of our standing wealth yearly, when it comes due, is due. And we can't dodge it. We, we can't live our life in, in, in the way we do and then, and then you know, ignore these types of things. And those who wear these robes of tar are the arrogant, the boastful, and the conceited. So this is one of the longer narrations, but there's others um, uh, that, 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 that also uh, talk about. So he says then that there is a standing place where people will be assembled. That there's this huge plain where the Prophet said, mankind will be gathered on a single plain and each will hear the summoner and the, the eyesight will be penetrating. It will be very serious in terms of the events that they're saying, that they're seeing. Um, and then there is going to be a standing place where the jinn, human beings, and the, the shayateen, and the cattle, and the wild beasts, and the predators are all assembled, are all in one place. And it will be very, very, very crowded. And there will be turmoil and difficulty. And the sun will draw near until it is one mile above their head. One mile. So the sun right now, I don't know how many millions or hundred millions of miles it, the way it is. But it's just, if it were one mile, two miles, three miles closer, life could not exist on this planet. If it were a few miles farther, everybody would freeze. That's how perfect it is, the sun's distance from the planet Earth. This will be one mile from the resurrection, from the plane of resurrection. So if someone is not under the shade of God's throne, imagine the intensity and the heat and the sweat that we will feel on that day. And again, all the key to all of this is righteousness. All of it, all good lies in taqwa and a relate, good relationship with Allah. And, and akhlaq, good akhlaq with people. So all of these things can be protected from him. He says, people will be afflicted then by such great hardship, such heat and thirst, intense heat and thirst that only Allah knows of. They will perspire, meaning sweat, until their sweat penetrates the depths of the earth to a depth of 70 arm lengths. 70 arm lengths is, is a, usually an expression that's used to mean like a significant amount. It could be a lot more than just 70 um, arm lengths, but that's how deep it will, the sweat will penetrate into the earth. And he says, the sun will come near on the day of judgment. People will sweat. There will be those who would reach to their heels, to the middle of their legs, to their knees, to their thighs, to their waists, and to their mouths. And then here he raised his hand to his mouth, and some will be completely covered. He put his head over it. So it's very, 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 very intense. It's not a, um, it's, it's, in these, these matters, Imam Ghazali, he mentions in his book on, uh, Yom al qiyamah and death. He says that the vast majority of human beings don't believe really in the day of judgment. He said they don't really believe in it. He said if they really believe in among the Muslims, he's talking about the Muslims, if they really believed in it, he said there's no way we would live our lives the way we live our lives. He's like the reality of the day of judgment of what's going to happen has yet to penetrate the hearts of the vast majority of us. So what we have to do is reflect, reflect, reflect. We talked about this in one of the other, other texts, the importance of tafakkur, sitting, thinking, contemplating, visualizing, really internalizing what is going to happen to me and how am I going to be able to do this. And then what's going to happen usually when someone does that is they start to tremble and they start to weep for Allah because they realize I can't do it without Allah. And then we realize how in need we are of Allah and our, our abject servitude before him that we need him in every moment and if we need him in every moment in this life, surely we will need him in every moment in this, in the day of judgment. And then we realize we can't do it on our own. We turn to Allah. And now one starts to live a life where, where the reality of 
of, of or we start to hopefully experience the reality of slavehood and servitude to Allah. Um, but the reflection is very, very, very critical. So we'll mention one more and then we'll end. Um, inshallah, he says, alayhi salatu wasalam, so he gives a lot of ways out on this day. One of them, he says, one will be under the shade of their charity on the Yom Al-Qiyamah. The shade of their charity. So give, we should give while we can. While we have the money, while we have the ability, give. Because these are types of things that will protect us. And another, and well, this is the, 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 a very important hadith. So we'll cover this in the Quran. Seven kinds of people will be shaded by Allah on, on the shade of his throne. When no shade will exist except Allah's. The first is a just leader, a just ruler. The second, a young person who grew up in the worship of Allah. The third, someone whose heart was attached to the masjid. The fourth, two people who have love for each other for the sake of Allah, who came together in this and separated in this. The next, someone who, when they were seduced in this narration, a man who, when a woman of rank and beauty attempted to seduce him, said, I fear Allah. I fear Allah. This is what happened in the story of Yusuf, alayhi salam. Um, and of course, you know, you would assume this happens in the, the inverse way as well, that anyone who guarded their chastity when they could have given it, right? When it was very easy to give in, but they guarded their chastity. The next, someone who concealed their charities, they gave so much charity, they concealed it such that their left hand did not know what the right hand spent. Obviously, that doesn't mean literally the left hand may or may not actually have knowledge, but it means just giving and giving and giving and not telling other people about it, just being really humble about the charity that we give, right? And, um, and then another one, the one who remembered Allah when alone and whose eyes overflowed with tears, whose eyes overflowed with tears. So these are among the seven. Um, I believe in there, 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 there are various ways in which we can seek Allah's protection against us. But this hadith, which is a famous hadith, this is the type of thing we want to be in every single category here. We don't want to take any chances. No chances. We've got to be people who, the last one, we regularly weep before Allah. We spend time with Allah alone, weeping before him. Communal worship is critical. In Ramadan, we also want to make sure we have time just for alone worship, especially in the last 10 nights. And in the, that sunnah in the last 10 nights is to withdraw from creation. So we spend a little time with the people, with the group, and do the, whatever we can at Jama'at, and then go by ourselves, be with Allah alone, weeping before him. It's easier to become emotional in our connection, usually when we're alone, if we're able to. Kind of giving a lot of charity, sadaqah. This is, practically speaking, it's very easy. Go on a web, go on Islamic Relief, put your credit card information in, and just recurring payments. $100 a month, $50 a month, $10 a month, whatever we're able to afford. Let it go. Just you, So you don't even have to think about it, but it's just being done, right? Like just like we subscribe to things, we have a charity subscription, which is going. And the more we can, every time we get an increase in income, hopefully our charity should increase, inshallah. Every time, even if we don't get an increase, we should give. We should keep giving an increase and in, in more. But these types of things are easy for us to do, practically speaking, right? Um, another one. Uh we don't necessarily want to be in a category where we're faced with, with having to um, uh, choose the, the hadith about someone who, someone of rank and beauty comes to try to seduce them. So maybe that's not one we seek. Um, and the next one, the one whose heart is attached to the masjid. That's, what does that mean? It means between the prayers, between the jummah, someone is excited to go back to the masjid. A sign of iman and belief, people, we like being in the masjid. A sign of hypocrisy, we can't wait to get out. And when is this thing going to be done? When is Jummah going to be done? When is the Khatib going to be done? I got to go. Not like if we have to go to work, that's different. But like, just like, I just want to get out of here. I just like, I want, I'd rather go and, you know, go to the mall or something like that, right? The, 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 this being attached to the masjid is a very noble thing. Um, and the one that hopefully we can all do, because we talked about youth, and youth is really in that age before 35 or 40, growing up in the worship of Allah. Trying to do worship while we're still able, like, while we have choices to not do it. Because everybody, as they get older, as we talked about, you're compelled, really. It's not, the, the choice is not the same. When one when, when is younger, there's so many more passions and options that are available. 
And a just leader could be a leader who, if everybody is leading someone or another, right? This could be a, you, someone is leading a team at work. This could be that if you are a leader in your family, if you are a mother, if you're a father, you are a leader in your family. If you have younger siblings, you're a leader. And there's various ways. If someone is in an organization and they're leading, so on and so forth, right? So there's various doors by which we enter from. We want to be like the people who don't leave any um, uh, uh, door open or closed rather, don't leave any door closed. Every door we want open, we want to go through all of them as much as possible. And, and um, he mentions then, whoever reprieves someone who is insolvent or agrees to reduce their debt will be shaded by Allah's throne. So there's other narrations which mention the shade of Allah's throne, meaning somebody owes you debt and you say, you know what, I'm gonna reduce the debt or it's, 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 it's forgiven, um, it's forgiven. Alhamdulillah. So with that, if there's any questions, um, we'll do the questions now, inshallah, and then we'll pray. And then next time, we hope, inshallah, we can finish. I think we should be able to finish this section on the Day of Judgment. Let's see. Uh, inshallah, we'll finish this section, and then the following class, we'll do the uh, Jannah and Jahannam. And then those are the lives of, of man, of the human being. Good question. If you take out a loan, so you take the, in, the interest-bearing instrument, even though you could pay it off? Um, that would be haram. Yeah, so any any time anyone, to, so even if you can't pay it off, interest has nothing to do with whether one can pay it off or not. The instrument in and of itself is something that invites the wrath of Allah. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, this is Quran, Allah and his messenger wage war on the one who takes interest. They don't say that about alcohol, or about adultery, about um, murder. I mean, there's so many other big sins which have big punishments, but in, who wage war. Because the economic system, one of the first things the Prophet ﷺ did in Mecca is he fixed the unjust economic system which interest was a big part of the unjust economic system. So uh, there's various ways in which one can go about building credit, as an example. I mean, this is not a class on, on that. Um, but let's just say you could take out a credit card. And as long as you're making the payments every month, you're never charged interest on the credit card. So credit card in and of itself is not impermissible if someone is making the payments such that they will never be charged interest because the interest only happens when you exceed the credit limit. If it's like 5K limit and you exceed it and you don't pay off the balance, the interest comes. But the instrument which bears the interest in and of itself, so the auto loan, if they say, hey, there's 6% APR, 5% APR, and we take anything more than 0% APR, that in and of itself puts us in the category of haram. And now we have to do whatever we can to pay off that loan, right? Um, the only workaround would be that if, 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 from a financial point of view, if somebody were to go and buy a car and they were to say, put in the contract the amount that into my principal that, and make sure that it's 0% APR. And then you pay off the amount and you can do it over a phase period of time. Contractually, that would be valid in the Sharia. But in form and in, in, in uh, taking out the, the instrument in and of itself, like in, in this scenario, would not be permissible. Um, and it's not really a view, it's also not a viewpoint thing. Like we want to make sure with regards to these topics, this is black and white, halal, haram, right? There's not really gray areas in, in when it's Quran. Uh, gray areas come when it's like a situation of desperation. Uh, and then there's very, there's like gray areas that can come. Yeah. Yes. Like a bank? Um, or was there another example of it? Was it were you referring to a bank or another example? Yeah, good question. Um, so the question was, what would, in terms of working for a company in which, let's say, interest is the primary means of, 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 uh, of revenue, or um, that's like what the role. So if you're in the role of actually collecting that, like that is your role, you are the loan officer, you are something else, that's not a permissible job, according to the vast majority of ulama. There's difference of opinion. I go by the opinion that one should avoid it entirely. Just like the institution in and of itself, we should avoid it. That's like the dominant opinion that I've always learned is that working for companies in which that is the primary means of revenue, we should avoid it because there's ample opportunities out there. 
I have seen opinions in which if you're not the one who's actually doing the core work of that, um, there's some room for, for, you know, for like a ruksa, like permissibility, but um, it doesn't really like, I don't think it holds that much strength because there's still so much risk in it mixing with the income. Uh, but, you know, the, it, it would depend on like a case by case kind of basis. Yeah. Life insurance is haram, categorically. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, life insurance, yeah, sure. Um, so the uh, provision of what happens when you die is Allah's responsibility. The first spiritual concept is you don't place your trust in anything except Allah. So you don't say that I'm gonna take out a $500,000 policy so that my children when I die, even though I didn't do anything to earn that policy, what you're doing is you're saying, I put in, you might've put in a thousand dollars. People do this, they game the system, then they like, you know, fake things and all these types of things. But they might put a thousand dollars and all of a sudden, $500,000 appears, right? And they put their trust in that policy and not in Allah. That as a concept is haram, coupled with the fact that you turned a little bit of money without any like real, there's no investment in that. There's no uh, shared, um, uh, like the way a stock would work where you have you share in the up and in the down uh, and then you would all of a sudden that policy would turn into into a bunch of money insurance in general in the sharia is a very like um, debated subject but we live in a country we live in you have to take out certain policies like car insurance and these other types of things but there's a lot of debate amongst the fuqaha and majority of them leaning towards like you should just avoid all of these but you can't in certain circumstances right um, uh, but the life insurance is not mandatory by at all. So we should avoid life insurance policies, avoid accepting payout from life insurance policies and, and so on. Yeah. Like auto insurance or, you know, home insurance or something like that. Yeah. No, I don't think it's e it's it's not bl at that black and white to say that it's for sure. Huh? Yeah, you would want it. You would want to like check in, in that situation. I would recommend um, checking with a faqi, a scholar of fiqh who studied f uh, the jurisprudential pr principles that relate very specific. Because this stuff is deep. It's like not simple. Right? You go really, really, really deep. There's a lot of principles that relate to it. Um, so it's that it's not as like black and white. Um, if you're selling life insurance policies and that's your main job, that would be avoidable, right? But there's there are other areas where there's probably room. So I would actually, you'd want to check, um, and maybe we can talk after. I could try to think of somebody you'd refer, before, if you have deeper questions to refer you to, who's like studied in this, because I'm not studied in, in finance, uh, jurisprudential, you know, rulings, yeah. Uh, sister side, anything? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, the question, the question is about bank accounts and the interest that's collected and um, earned. So first, uh, you avoid the accounts which have high APYs. So there's no, there's like, so you, your checking accounts, they give no money at all in checking accounts, right? So you, unless you have like $5 million, $20 million, I mean, they're not giving anything on, uh, you know, the vast majority of us in, in terms of what we keep in checking account, right? Um, maybe your situation is different. Alhamdulillah, Allah bless you. But anyhow, so, so that is... The, let's say it's it's like two cents or two dollars at the end of the year. What you do with that, if 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 you did get that, you actually just give it away. You donate that amount. Um, so it's it wouldn't be something that you would actually keep. Uh, and you just take that amount. The intention is this is the amount that I've earned. But intentionally opening like a savings account, which allows you to make a lot of money on the APY because it's locked there for a period of time. That would be an, again an impermissible instrument there would be no need to do that right if you have your money though in a savings account that just has like again a very 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 minor percentage you just have it in there delineate your account just take out that money and it tells you at the end of the year this is the amount that you got it's usually very negligible and you just make sure to give it away yeah make that intention yeah 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that giving the money. Um, if we have that type of money, the little bits that we get, you give it to any charity. It's not a you don't have to give it to like the worst charity in the world. Um, it's it's you know it, and definitely don't give it to non-Muslim charity uh, or some Zionist or something like that. Um, we want to just give it to. Uh, any you know any charity is generally fine just like give that money away it doesn't need to be like destroyed or something like that right but it's wealth that we do not want to keep we're saying ya Allah I, this is not money that I want to actually um, keep and I am you know bound by the circumstances that I'm in there's varying degrees I'm sure there's a lot more depth to this topic um, for the sake of time we probably won't get into all the nuances of it maybe some of the but maybe some some of the scholars said other things and to give it to other places or to get rid of it entirely. I'm not sure if this is just the minimal amount that I've learned about it is um, yeah, in line with kind of what you're saying, just kind of give it, give it away. Yeah. Okay. Other questions, um, questions online. I have a question. Salam. How about DoorDash? If it's haram food that we bring, <clears throat> that's a really good question. So if you're, if I'm assuming the question is if you're delivering the haram food, right? Um, yeah, if you're outright delivering like alcohol, um, that would be a problem. Uh, if you're delivering like a burger that's not halal, that's not necessarily the same. So it's a little bit tricky. If you could send me a DM, I can do a little more research and give me some more details on that. Um, so I'm wondering how can we attach ourselves to the masjid and knowledge if they're not available to us? Good question. So the intention is what matters here. So let's say we live in a community where we don't have a masjid. We make a strong intention, Ya Allah, if there were a masjid, I would love to be there. And one day I would love to be a, uh, the person who helps build a masjid in this area or in this community, right? So that's the intention that we want to try and um, and make. With regards to knowledge, alhamdulillah, in the time we live in, there's ample ways to learn knowledge, even if it's not locally available. So online, a lot of ways. I would highly recommend um, for the one asking the question or for anyone else, seekersguidance.org is a, is a platform which has um, like authentic Islamic knowledge just taught for free in all the key sciences of Islam, or most of the key sciences of Islam. So in Aqidah, in Fiqh, in Tazkiyah, in Tasawwuf, in, 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 um, in Arabic, if you'd like. And so there's various different types of knowledge that are taught. You can get the free classes, learn them. There's like sometimes they have 20 different um, se uh, sessions. It's like there's a curriculum. You follow along. You can listen to the recording, take it live. So there's actually ample ways to do it. The key is if you learn online to do so with reliable scholars, and um, YouTube is good, but be careful of like uh, uh, information on YouTube that's that's um, that could be off versus like an authenticated website that's a little bit more real. Um, just want to clarify: if you have a credit card, it's paid off before you fall into interest. It's okay to have. Yeah, if we have a credit card and we're not letting the interest ever touch the actual payment, we are okay, right? Because you're, all you're doing is you're borrowing money for a period of time, you're paying that money when it's due and at 0% is charged. What you avoid is ever being late uh, and getting into the insane APRs that they have. Okay, uh, we'll do 
with a few more questions. What if we work in a bakery that have Haram products? Will that job be Haram? Uh, no, you're, did that, you, you would assume that the risk that you're getting would be from the halal products, the permissible products, um, especially if you're talking about like minor ingredients that there's a difference of opinion on. Like, you know, um, so you usually would be fine there. But if but if you're working at like a like a liquor bakery or something, I don't know if there's a thing, but like a lot of people they put alcohol in their in their baked goods. If that's where you're working, yeah, I would avoid that, right? Like you're making all your money from people who are drinking uh, or or, think, or if you're working at like a cannabis bakery, that would be haram. Um, Okay, are there major signs before the 40 days of fog? Um, we didn't mention the 40 days of fog in today's class. The uh, major signs that you and I want to make sure that we know of are first, the coming of the Dajjal, the sun rising on the west, Jesus, son of Mary, descending. These major blasts or that earth-shaking events that take place um, the beast that comes and Yajuj and Majuj. Those are the ones that we want to make sure that we know of based on this, that, on this hadith. Uh, uh, oh, the name of the website is Seeker's Guidance. Seeker, like Seeker, S E E K E R S, guidance.org. Yes, question. So, Credit card points for the fact that credit card companies are going unpredatory uh, approach to know that other people can have credit card points. We may come to the point that they are this institution, or is it is it a case where we just have credit card points? Or just benefit from it? So, yeah, the question is about credit card points. So, credit card points are based on. Um, uh, there's no interest in credit card points. They're based on interchange fees and the interchange fees. So Visa charges like 2.6% interchange fee. Amex charges like a 3.2% interchange fee to merchants to allow for that service to happen. And what they're saying is, hey, instead of using the cash, when you use the credit card, we'll get the interchange fee and we'll give you a portion, like 1% of the interchange fee or half of the interchange fee or whatever else it is uh, because you used our service. So the way I've always understood it and... Um, there could, there could be varying differences of opinion on this. Allah knows best. Obviously, with all of these things, I would recommend checking with the mufti. Um, the credit card points are not usurious, and credit card points are not, there's nothing predatory about them. There's no predatory practices that are happening, in order the interchange fee is based on um, like an interchange financial network that's been set up internationally. Um, and then there's, there's ways in which you're using their payment rails, and they're benefiting, and then they're passing off that, some of that benefit to you. Okay, I think we have just one more question. How to become less materialistic, so less interested in dunya? Um, yeah, it's an entire, it's a, it's a lengthy topic. Uh, there's three things one needs to do. First one, we need to know that Allah puts no worth towards materialism. Allah does not put um, uh, worth towards uh, materialism and towards wealth and money and fame and luxury and these types of materialistic things. So if Allah doesn't put worth towards them, we want to work on detaching these things from our heart. The second thing is when one starts to give more and more money, then they um, uh, and start to spend less, let's say, on themselves and more on other people. It's a way of ridding their heart of this materialism, of this love of materialism. And the third way is that one reflects on the ahira and sees it as closer to them than the dunya that we live in. So if one does that and sees the reality of the akhira as closer, the materialism will all disappear. All the uh, things that, that we get for the sake of the dunya will all just disappear at one point and will, they will go away. But the deeds, what are called the baqiyat, the salihat, and the good deeds that we do, they're everlasting. Um, so if I buy a bunch of things and I have a bunch of nice cars and coats and bags and, you know, luxury things, even all that are even permissible, but they're just materialistic, consumeristic, it's all going to go away. I'll die and it's all going to end up in a junkyard one day. The Lamborghini, the Bugatti, the Louis Vuitton, it's all going to end up in the same junkyard at some point or like similar junkyards. Didn't do anything for me, right? Had I been less attached to that and maybe use that money in a little bit more of a better way, it would have been better for me. And so reflecting on, on what your wealth is supposed to be for will also be helpful. Inshallah.
So with that, we want to be mindful of time. We have to try so we'll continue um, uh, next time. Uh, clarify, buying car loan with bank loan is not permissible. Yeah, it is not permissible to buy a car with a bank loan. Not permissible. It's interest, bank loan, unless you get what's called a 0% APR loan, which some, uh, uh, in this interest rate environment, you're probably not going to get it, but in other, in, in, er, in other environments, auto, lender, uh, auto uh, agencies and dealerships would offer 0%. So if it's 0.0%, you're not paying any interest. You're good to go. But if it's anything more than that, then, then you are. Yeah. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammadin fil awaleen wa salli wa sallim wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammadin fil akhireen wa salli wa sallim wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammadin fil malil ala ila yawm al-deen Rabbana atina fi dunya hasnatan wa fil akhirati hasnatan wa kina adabanna Rabbana afliqa lina sabran wa thabit aqdamana wa sunna ala qawm al-kafirin la ilaha illa anta subhanak inni kuntum min al-zalimeen Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, Ya Kareem, Ya Rabbil Alameen We ask you Ya Allah, Ya Allah that you pardon our sins, that you forgive us, that you pour your mercy, your rahmah your shifa, your lutf, your gentleness, your kindness, your protection upon our brothers and sisters in Gaza, specifically in Rafah, Ya Rabbil Alameen, that you protect our brothers and sisters in Palestine, that you protect our brothers and sisters, Ya Rabbil Alameen, that you protect them against this onslaught, against this genocide, that you stop these things that are happening to them, Ya Allah, that you provide for those who are sick and who are hungry and who are thirsty and who are in fear and who are in trepidation and who are in worry and who are in despair, and that you help them and that you give them patience and that you give them ease and that you give them a way out, Ya Allah. We ask that you allow us to do whatever it we can, Ya Allah, through our du'as and through our gatherings and through whatever else we can do, Ya Allah, to help our brothers and sisters in Philistine, Ya Rabbil Alameen, and to make du'a for them and to not forget about what they're going through and to live our lives in a way where we are grateful for all of the blessings that you have given us, Ya Rabbil Alameen, and that we live our life, Ya Allah, that in a way we are serving you and serving this ummah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, we ask that you help the Muslims defeat the kuffar and that you plant their feet firmly and that you give them victory, Rabbana Afrika Lina Sabran. We ask that you help the Muslims in tribulation and in worry and in sickness and who have been affected by immense adversity all throughout the Muslim world. Ya Rabbil Alameen, Ya Allah, we ask that you help them. Ya Allah, and that you send your aid to them and that you allow for us as an ummah to be rectified and to be and, and to be rectified in the best of states and that you allow our akhirah to be far, far, far greater than our dunya, Ya Rabbil Alameen, that you reward all of those, Ya Allah, who have passed away in martyrdom and that you give them martyrdom and that you give them shahada and that you give them the best and best, 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 best million times over multiplied rewards, Ya Allah, that we cannot even fathom that you give them for their patience, especially for those who have lost their parents or their children or they're suffering, or they've lost their limbs, or they've lost their eyesight, or they've lost their ability, or they have no food, or they have nothing, but they have you, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We ask that you reward them for their taqwa, and that you reward them for their righteousness, and that you allow for their for, for us to all learn from their hilm and from their resoluteness, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We ask that you help us implement this knowledge, and that you allow us to realize the reality of the Day of Judgment, and that you allow us to live a life in which we properly fear you, in which we properly worship you. We ask that you give us afia and well-being, and that you remove our problems and our adversities, and that you allow us to be people of shukr and people of dhikr in the best of way. We ask that you allow us to follow the sunnah of the Prophet Sallam, and that you make us firm upon his sunnah.